Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer John Henry as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Queens, New York, John is a graduate of CUNY Queens College and the New York Film Academy. His work has been published both nationally and internationally and exhibited in numerous galleries, including Aperture Foundation, Smack Mellon, and Brick, among others. Publications include PDN Magazine, ID Magazine, and Jungle Magazine. He was recently named one of Lens Culture's Emerging Artists for 2019, and has also won the Film Photo Prize for Continuing Film Project, sponsored by Kodak. Over the past six years, John has been putting together one of the most powerful bodies of work in contemporary photography, Entitled Stranger Fruit, it comes in response to the senseless murder of African-American men across the nation by police violence. His primary focus is on the plight of the mother who must endure and carry on without her child. At this historical juncture, I cannot imagine a more timely or urgent I3 lecture than the one we are attending tonight so please help me welcome John Henry. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. Um, thank you, Brother Jaime, for the introduction. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody, SVA, for the um, invitation um, to speak about Stranger Fruit. Um, sisters, how y'all feel? Brothers, y'all all right? It has been an intense past few weeks wrapped up in a very intense past month in an even more intense year. Um, but I'm truly grateful to be able to have this time to speak about uh, Stranger Fruit. Uh, the great artist Charles White said, an artist must bear a special responsibility. They must be accountable for the content of their work and that work should reflect a deep concern for humanity. This project was created in response to the murders of African-American men due to police violence. Um, now, originally, you know, just a few weeks ago in May, I was going to start with a video recapping um, some of the footage that we have, you know, easily forgotten of um, police brutality in the just like recent five, six, even 10 years um, from Eric Garner to Tamir Rice to Walter Scott, to Lake Juan McDonald. But with what has transpired in the past few weeks, that is not really necessary. We have to really go down that road to see the footage over and over again. Um, you've seen the footage of Ahmed Arbery. You need to know Breonna Taylor. You really need to know Tony McDade. You need to know these stories. And of course, you've seen the footage of George Lloyd, and you've also seen the footage of Sean Reed, all this within the past month. Um, they're difficult to look at and they're difficult to live with, but it's crucial to know what is at stake. You know, lives are being lost and it's important that we view this honestly and that we know what is going on. Um, you know, I grew up in a church and you know, I worked in this church where I made the first image uh, for many years. And you know, there was something that really stood out to me about the audio from George Floyd. And it was you know, truly heartbreaking hearing him you know, face down in the pavement screaming out, mama, mama. And you know, me thinking about church and thinking about my mother and you know, just that upbringing, all that that immediately translated to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, that's just, you know, a personal thing for, um, you know, what I was thinking the second I heard it. Um, now, we'll talk about the technical aspects of the project and the art historical references and how each element, you know, really came to being. And again, why it's so critical that we're speaking about it now. But I really wanted to just like hammer home this idea of, you know, this, how the finality of death is being handled, you know, lives are being lost. 
this isn't up for a debate anymore. Like people are dying and because of police brutality, there is no reason for any of this to take place. None of these people should have died. There's no excuse that can be given. Um, so we're gonna start from there. Um, it began, the project began in 2014 with this image. Um, at the time I was unsure of, you know, what to create, but I had the, the need to create existed. Um, I know that I wanted something as close to the Pieta as possible. And, you know, this was, sh this was shot in that church, St. George's Flushing, that I used to work in. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, something I was thinking about in 2014. Now, the project really began in, well, before I get to where the project really began, is I want to just address that, you know, while I'm speaking of a mother and son, it is crucial at this time that we recognize that, you know, Black trans lives matter as well. Black women matter as well. All of this is under this umbrella that has all been under the same scrutiny. And we have to, you know, fight for everybody because everyone of color is at stake in this. So I just want to like, make sure that's clear. I mean, the, I'm photographing mother and son because I'm drawing back on my relationship with my own mother. I know what that is like, you know, where mom's always saying, you know, be careful out there, be careful out there. And even now I'm, you know, about to be 38. My mom still says, be careful out there. Okay, well, you know, obviously it takes a while for you to understand what, you know, your parents are concerned about. So again, this project, you know, it began in 2014 with this image, but the concept really began in 2008. Um, 2008 was the verdict of the Sean Bell uh, trial. And Sean Bell was the young man from Jamaica, Queens, who was murdered at his bachelor party. Um, I didn't know Sean personally, but you know, I'm born and raised in Queens, New York, and I know Jamaica very well. I used to go and hang out there all the time. And you know, this, this murder really stayed with me for a very long time. This happened in 2006, um, but the verdict was 2008. Um, I had just come back from Vienna visiting my sister and the rest of the family. And one of the next days I was going back to work was seeing this in the morning and seeing the cops, you know, get away and there's nothing done. There's no justice served. So that really, you know, it just started reliving the trauma of having to, you know, endure this and this trauma that the community goes over and over and over again. And that really, you know, obviously that really affected me. Um, later that year, 2008, one of my good friends was getting married and I was one of the groomsmen. And at his bachelor party, that's all I could think of was what if this was happening to us? What if this was happening to him? What would I, what could be done to console my mother, to console his mother? You know, why did this have to happen? And why again, does it have to lead to death? Um, so, you know, 2008, you know, at the time I wanted to say something about it, but I just didn't have the visual language to say anything about it. Um, it always stayed in the back of my mind, but then, you know, 2014 was when the project really began. And I, you know, I studied photography for a little bit and then I finally knew like, okay, I wanted to say something. I knew what I wanted to make. So again, that's how this image came to be. But you know, at the time I didn't know if this was going to be a project or if this was a standalone piece is, you know, at the time I was photographing athletes primarily. So this was a far departure from that mode of work. Um, so I started to do research. Research was, you know, one of the big things that I um, um, believed in. And um, so little secret, while I was supposed to be in school, I was cutting school to go hang out at the Met and study painting. So I would just sit there, study painting independently. So that and the background from the church, I was always glued to religious iconography. So that's why the Pietà was pretty much the natural landing point. But like I said, I wanted to do more research. I wanted to learn more about the subject. I wanted to really, you know, get, you know, knee deep in all of this work. So I started looking at different versions. And of course I started with Michelangelo here on the left um, from 1498 and Titian 
on the right from 1575. And again, why the Pieta, the Pieta, you know, I'm thinking of this, you know, grand act of suffering, this, you know, this incredible loss for a mother and putting the modern twist on it, you know, no mother should have to go through this type of suffering, this type of pain. And, you know, how that leads to, you know, frustration and anger, again, because these things continue to happen. Even with the footage, we have, you know, dash cam footage, we have cell phone footage, you're seeing the stuff over and over again. And, you know, even when this is, you know, brought into trial, we're still seeing the same, um, the same verdicts. And that's not even justice, you know, justice is it's not happening, you know, how can we get to the root of this um, issue? So again, I wanted to look at different versions of the Pieta and different, you know, just to see what else is out there. Um, so these two are both by Andres Serrano, you know, two vastly different interpretations. And, you know, I was really interested just with artists using this motif and putting their spin on it. And again, I'm finding different artists and, you know, some of them are more playful, some of them are more serious. But again, taking the motif and using it with their ideas and, you know, to the story that they want to tell. So still not sure if this is a project, but upon, you know, coming across these two versions, now I know it's a project. This really was a breakthrough for the work. On the left, the amazing Renee Cox in her piece, Ain't Your Mama's Pieta, and on the right, Dr. David Driscoll's Behold Thy Son. And this really was a breakthrough for the project and for myself because it really got me thinking of the black body in art. And not just the black body, but recorded and displayed by a black artist and what that means for the, a black person to have agency and have the decisions and make, have control over how the figure is being displayed. So that was really important for me and I, it's, you know, something I hadn't considered. And it really gave me this chance to speak about, you know, masculinity, identity and vulnerability. And again, it really strengthened that mother son connection for me. Um, on the right, this painting by Dr. David Driscoll who um, passed away in the last month um, titled Behold Thy Son. This was in 1956. He painted this one year after the murder of Emmett Till in 1955. He was so affected by Emmett Till's murder that he had to create this piece. So there were parallels between Dr. David Driscoll's work in relation to Emmett Till and mine thinking of Sean Bell. So this is how I knew that you know, investigation was required and that this was something that I had to follow through and, you know, investigate. So this is where the project really, you know, took off. Um, and this is not a, this is not simply a New York um, issue. A lot of these have happened in New York, but this is a national issue. I mean, it truly, it's a global issue, but I wanted to speak about it here in a national sense in American, you know, what's going on with police brutality across America. So it was important to travel to multiple locations across the country to, you know, make these images because again, all these families could be, this could happen to anybody. These attacks have been so random and so senseless that you really don't know what to feel. I feel it could be any, any one of us. Um, and, you know, in the images, I'm thinking of, you know, like, again, I'm thinking of strategies. I'm thinking as an artist, as a visual purpose person, what are different strategies I can use for storytelling? So I'm thinking of, you know, the skin and I'm thinking of vulnerability. You know, people, you know, when, I'm, when you're with your mother, you leave to go to school or to the store or to work and they can't protect you. And, you know, just those thoughts I'm interested in going back and forth with. Um, you know, something, and again, that's really important for me and for the work is this idea of gaze. And that's the mothers staring directly into camera and staring directly into the viewer and how that makes us feel. Um, almost like it's an appeal to the viewer, um, making it difficult to look away. 
And again, falling back on research that comes from another version of the Pieta, this one by William A. Bougereau from 1876. And there's just something about Mary's eyes that are just really striking that it's, you know, staring directly into the, um, into the viewer and it makes it difficult to, you know, just encounter and then walk away from. So I wanted to, you know, use that again as a strategy to hold the viewer, um, you know, because of the device, because of cell phones, the internet, you know, wherever we are, we're inundated with imagery. So I'm thinking as a visual artist, what can I use to ground the viewer for just, you know, two seconds? How can you live with an image for two seconds? What can you do to keep them there for 10 seconds? What can you do to keep them there for an hour? What can you do to keep them there for a week? Um, it's crazy. Like, you know, even in New York now, the, um, in the train stations, the advertisements are digital. So it's just, it's like nonstop loop of imagery, not, you know, just going on and on and on. You barely even have a chance to breathe. So, you know, thinking of this as an artist, you know, on the come up and thinking of, you know, different strategies, ways to, you know, hold the viewer's attention. And I think it's important to make that connection where you, the viewers start to really think like, you know, really get into the minds of these mothers, because again, this is a reality. We're not, you know, this, this issue is something real. It's tangible. You're seeing it play out on the streets right now. Just look outside your window. There have been protests across the country in every state. So this is very real. This is of the now. Um, but again, you know, I would still continue to, you know, do research and, you know, looking up um, different, um, you know, representations of the black body. And I, you know, was reintroduced to the work of Kehinde Wiley and his series and his work is drawn, you know, directly from classical painting using the poses and such. And this was another breakthrough for the work um, because it gave me the opportunity to now problem solve excuse me, I was able to pose the bodies in a way that I needed to still be able to tell the same story. I'm no longer glued to strict representation, meaning I'm no longer glued to having the mother hold her son because sometimes it's physically impossible. Um, sorry, I have to go back to this image. I always do this. If you look at the Michelangelo piece on the left, Mary's scale is enormous in relation to the scale of Jesus, a 33 year old man. We're not always thinking about this in the work, but this is something that I would have to encounter later on as I was posing these different men of different ages. So this was great because it, like I said, it freed me up. I was able to make, you know, find different representations, different poses and different ways to display these men. Again, strong yet vulnerable, but still, the, you know, telling the same story and breaking a little bit of the repetition of the project. Um, but still, you know, something was missing and I didn't want it to just be these singular images, mother, son, you know, over and over and over again. I thought that was a bit redundant. So I felt that the project needed more. So again, you know, going back to research, I started to look at the work of Frances Kearney and her work, this piece titled Five People Thinking the Same Thing from 1998. And this was really interesting for me because it was these, you know, these portraits of people, but they're not looking into the camera. So I thought that that might be an interesting strategy to, you know, have these as images where we can really use the environment to tell, you know, what, the, you know, for the viewer to now think what's going on in these mothers' heads, what's going on in these families? What is, how can we use the environment to help read the image? So I began photographing mothers as well. Again, thinking of this in the background. And, you know, a number of, you know, keywords would pop up, thinking of absence, isolation, loss, remembrance, hope. You know, sometimes in the images, you 
can sense that there's a presence that's there that's missing, sometimes not so much. And really I'm thinking of, um, you know, what is it, excuse me, I'm thinking of one, it's a connection to the parents of those who have lost, you know, what, when the trials are over, when the protesters have gone home, a month down the road, three months down the road, you know, how do you cope with routine? How do, what, what does normal look like again after the tragedy? You know, what are those quiet moments? How do you, how is life supposed to get back on the move? So, you know, again, I'm thinking about this, you know, all the time, thinking of these mothers and this, you know, tremendous loss that they must have. And, you know, again, going back to this, you know, vast image database. So, I'm, you know, when I'm out there making images, I'm thinking of all the images that, you know, obviously we've encountered. And of course, this is from, this is Carrie Mae Weems and her amazing kitchen table, the kitchen table series. Um, and I just love it because it's something, you know, simple yet complex. You know, the light is the same, the table's the same, but the props, the characters, the wardrobe changes. And it's just, you know, minimal, but it's so layered. But again, I'm thinking, you know, anytime I'm out there making images, if I see something that reminds me of another, you know, image from a master, you know, I'll use that as reference moving forward. You know, but again, you know, so we have the images of the mother, son, and, you know, the Pieta recreations, and those are, you know, strong. And we also have the images of the mother um, by herself. And those are, that's actually the harder image to make. I always like somehow mess that up. Um, but we have those two images, but you know, I always felt there was something missing with the project and I really didn't know what it was. And I struggled with it for about a year, year and a half where I didn't know what was the final chapter of the project, so to say. Um, I didn't know if it was maybe there need to be more images, maybe there needs, maybe the sun needs to come back in some type of, you know, redemptive way. And then, you know, where I, I was in Chicago making these images um, or photographing like six families over two days. And you know how Facebook, you'll send you these reminders saying like, oh, you've been friends with so-and-so for a year or two years or whatever the hell it is. So Nefertiti, her, reposted her, the images that we had made the previous year. And she wrote this amazing poem and it just struck me in the heart like a bullet. It stopped me dead in my tracks. And that was it. That was the final part of the project. The image, the word, the, having the words from the mothers in the project would be what would round it out. And this is what she wrote. As I hold my son in my arms, there is nothing strange about him. He is indeed the fruit of my womb, the extension of his father and me, growing, stretching, reaching to the skies. There is nothing strange about him. He is heaven in my eyes, an angel in disguise, handcrafted into a beautiful soul. There is nothing strange about him, for he is the fruit that I have bared, which makes me whole. There is nothing strange about him. He is my son, he is my soul, and he is beautiful. Years later, reading that now, every time I go back into the text, it still hits me. And it was just, you know, so beautiful. And this was, you know, this was it. This was that third part of the project that would, you know, make everything whole. You know, the images are my words. The artist statement is my words, but having the words of the mothers, the participants, the people who are in the project, the people who are going through this, having them, you know, share their words really just blew me away. So what I did was I started to, I put together a little survey, just a little quick, you know, six question thing, you know, just asking them, you know, what they thought about going into the project, 
describing the act of holding, physically holding their son, you know, just keywords that they thought were important. How do they approach the topic with their children? Um, and just, you know, just like things like this and the, the range of answers. And this is, this is just a, a snippet of it. This is just part of the, this full conversation um, are just you know, amazing. They're just beautiful. They're so honest and so strong. And obviously these are things that I could never write, but you know, having that is essential to the project. And I would say as important as the images. I mean, of course the images are gonna come first and that's what you're gonna look for, but the images and the text are married together. I feel greatly protective and greatly aware of the love and connection I have in my heart and soul for my son. I feel sad, sad that mothers actually have to go through this. My son was able to put, get up and put back on his clothes. Others, not so much. They're still mentally frozen in that position, that sadness, that brokenness. I feel guilty to be relieved that it's just a picture because for others it's reality. I feel scared. I feel next. I feel like Tyler could be that next hashtag. If there was any doubt that this is a serious topic and that this is a, something serious going on in America right now, all you have to do is just take a look at these words. And again, these words are echoing sentiments from millions of mothers across the country. This is something very real and something very scary. Um, and again, these texts are, you know, incredibly strong, so they have to live on their own in the, in context. Basically, they can't live as captions. And, you know, something that was really beautiful in the texts is the range of emotion in the, in all the words. Um, and meaning that it's not, you know, the same thing over and over and over again, or like the same emotion, same sentiment of like sadness and sadness upon sadness and trauma and grief, you really get to see the love that these mothers have and you know that honesty and just how deeply they feel for their children and how they could never imagine or never, you know, just never imagine that this could happen to them and how it, you know, shakes them to their core just to think about it. And, you know, I give all the credit in this project to the mothers who have been a part of it. I mean, yeah, I'm the one making the image and traveling for it, but this is all about the mothers and their strength because this is, it's emotional. This is very difficult work for them to just allow themselves to be this vulnerable because many people who I've reached out to, you know, trying to photograph, it's been too much for them. And I completely understand that it hits too close to home. They don't want to put themselves in that position. They don't want their sons placed in that position. And, you know, again, I completely understand. Uh, this is the last text piece I'll read. As I was gradually pulled into the scene and told about the pose, it began to make me think of the daily thoughts I have about my son. I have thoughts of love, change, determination, growth and encouragement. I also have concerns regarding his health and safety as it relates to the growing conditions across this nation with African-American males. There needs to be immediate attention to stop the killing of black males and suffering of mothers. So again, the, the texts are you know, incredibly strong and incredibly powerful. Um, so they have to live with the work as its own piece. So in the exhibitions in you know, really only solo exhibitions and eventually when this project becomes a book, will you get to really see, you know, all three parts of the project together. But it's important to have these texts on display Now we can't talk about the project without talking about the process and how the images are made. So yes, the images are all shot on four by five. That's my four by five. Her name is Lucy. Yes, my camera's name is Lucy. 
yes, you can address her as such. Um, so yeah, me and Lucy, we travel across the country, um, you know, for this project. And this, you know, I know this is a conversation around, you know, the digital photography school. Um, that's not to say that I, I only shoot film. You know, I shoot whatever the project demands. So for the majority of my athletes work, I'm using digital. For the majority of my portraiture, I'm photographing either a medium format or large format. So it's, it's, it varies. I'll use pretty much whatever camera I feel like, whatever makes the most sense to me. Um, but yeah, so this, these images are all created on a four by five camera. Um, and yeah, you know, it gives you, you know, higher resolution and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But really it was the mode of working, which is why I had to use this camera. Um, it really is a slower pace and it calls for an attention to detail. So I'm thinking of the images less like a photographer, but more like a painter where I'm building the scene and building everything, composing everything in the scene to make one image, to make two images. And yeah, people don't believe me because I just travel with this camera and a light meter and I take maybe two to four images. That's it. There's no taking 10 photos. There's no taking 20 photos. This stuff is not cheap. And I don't have no money. It's about $8 a photo when you do the math. So there are 52 final images right now. Do the math. Um, so it's important to get everything right in camera. And, you know, I'm looking at everything and I'm not, you know, taking anything for granted. And of course, you know, I still make mistakes and, you know, I'm only human. But I, you know, if something's not working in the frame, I don't take the image. I make sure that I have everything, you know, aligned and everything looks proper before we make the image. And, you know, also, um, you know, thinking of this, thinking of the four by five, it, since I'm only making, you know, one to two images per set, it really heightens the importance for everybody for myself, but also for the families, since it's a slower pace, you know, the mothers and the sons really are getting into this, you know, connection. And it really starts to sink in when a mother is holding her son and, you know, really thinking, you know, what is this? What could be happening here? And I think that's really important because again, and that's why the images, you know, all the people in the images, they're all mother or son, because that's, something that cannot be faked in the, in the work. Um, now, while it is a slower, it is a slower pace. Um, if you can ask any of my assistants, I work ridiculously fast, which is kind of crazy. And that's because, you know, we I just don't have, one, we're in public places, two, we simply don't always have the time to really take a long time to make these images. So there are often times where I will be with a family for maybe 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, usually not much longer than that. And I have to, you know, make these decisions to get these images, you know, prepped and ready and shot. And then we're back on the road. Um, so it is, um, it is a lot and it is, very heavy. And if you've ever used a four by five, you know, it's a lot that can go wrong. Um, but if you've ever been in one of my four by five classes, you know that I sing my little song and I get through the day. Um, now, again, I'm thinking of, you know, showing this entire frame in these images. And I'm doing that because, you know, just to reinforce the idea that there's very little manipulation going on. There's no cropping. I'm not you know, altering the images in, you know, any ridiculous way. It's just, you know, standard color correction. And really it's just speaking to the fact that um, this is the reality for these families in this moment. And I just want to make sure that that's uh, clear in these recordings. Another important um, part of the project is 
this idea of performance or the performative aspect. And that's pretty critical to understanding, you know, the entire project. Um, these, you know, oftentimes we think of performance as we think of it as like dance or acting or video. Um, but this too is performance, even though they are stills. Um, these mothers have not lost their sons, but they understand that this could happen to them. So it's important to have that distinction in these, in these images. And you know, I'm, again, I'm thinking of environment often when I'm making the images. I'm thinking of where we're making the images, how, you know, what's that relationship to where we're going. Um, and what I mean by that, I mean like urban versus rural images. Um, I want there to be some differentiation and that's why we have to travel from, you know, state to state going across the country. Um, but these environments are all local to these families. So this is either, you know, where they live or where they work. Like this is their home, like this is their neighborhood. Um, this image in particular, they live right across the street. Um, so I think that was, you know, really important just to tell the story of where they are currently. Um, and thinking of, you know, how I scout for locations and how I, you know, figure out all of that, um, thank goodness for Google Maps because one, I do not drive. I'm a classic New Yorker. I'm not really interested in driving. One day, maybe, maybe not. Um, so I have to do my scouting ahead of time. So I go on Google Maps and I look at all, all these locations and I think about, okay, well maybe this can work, maybe this can work. Just to give me an idea of like the layout of the land and say, okay, well maybe, you know, you know, and I, and I don't want it to be like obvious. I don't want to beat the viewer over the head with, you know, for instance, the image on um, the Magnificent Mile in Chicago, you know, that stupid silver bean is like three blocks south of where we made the image. I don't want something like that to tell like, oh, we're in Chicago, we get it. But I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for nuance. I'm looking for these smaller signifiers that, yeah, this is a neighborhood. This is you know, this is emblematic of Alabama. This is, you know, Chicago. This says, this is LA. Um, and again, you know, being able to, you know, just like browse through up and down the blocks through Street View. And it's, it's really difficult to explain because it is really all in my head. You know, the thing, the specific things that I'm looking for. And I really, it really just all comes together magically when I get there. Um, so like, for instance, this location here, this is um, Jersey City. This was just like a screenshot that I took and I wasn't even really thinking of photographing this family here where I wanted to go was maybe a couple blocks away. But when I was walking up to their house, um, there was like scaffolding and all types of like building stuff in front of it. So I was like, okay, well that, that won't work. Um, but again, I still had this image. So I was like, okay, you know, I've seen that this could work. If I've seen this neighborhood, I think I have an idea of what can work. And then, you know, we're able to go from there and make the image. So again, I'm looking for, you know, indicators of the neighborhood, what, you know, and something, it can be something simple. just like, you know, a front yard, a palm tree, an alley, you know, something that says like, yeah, this is different from the others. This is, you know, here, this is there. And this is, this is the map of where we've been and where we're going. So the, the original map is right here a little um, trusty map that I keep in my notebook and under my keyboard. Um, but these, the X's is where I've been with the project. Um, we've been, you know, New York, Rhode Island, Buffalo, DC, 
et cetera, et cetera. And the triangles are the areas that I'm looking to go to next um, because this is an ongoing project and I'm hoping to finish it within the year. I'm hoping to finish it, well, thank you COVID-19 as you've you know, put a monkey wrench in all my travel. Um, Cause I was supposed to be in um, St. Louis in April but all of that's been pushed back, but I'll get there eventually. We'll, you know, figure this all out, but you know, I'm, you know, looking to go to Utah. Um, why Utah? I just, you know, again, we have these, you know, artists, we have these images that we have to make. And, you know, I have this like vision of like the black bodies and mountains behind them just like burned into my mind. So whenever I have that feeling, I just have to do it. And I don't, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out later. I don't care how much it costs. I'll make it happen and I go do it. Um, you know, Omaha as well. Like I have to go somewhere like, you know, middle America, it's like the middle of nowhere it just has to happen. Um, St. Louis and, you know, potentially Atlanta, um, i would probably be going to as well. Um, and just, again, I'm thinking of, you know, big city, small city, you know, urban area, rural area, and just this mix again, because if you look at the, if you look at the murders, that have happened, they've happened all across the, you know, all across the country and in the most random of areas, you know, some are in a park, some are on a street corner, some are, you know, just, just these most random areas. So that's why it's important that we're traveling to all these locations and, you know, trying to give as many different backdrops as possible to, you know, put with the work. Um, you know, something that's really important, you know, the last really major thing that we're going to talk about today is this idea of audience and who is, I guess, the target audience for the work. And I know like every artist will say, well, you know, my work is for everybody. Okay, well, what the hell does that mean? Um, the work is, you know, it's fine art and it typically lives in a gallery or a museum, like those are the traditional places where fine art lives. But I'm not just speaking to a fine art crowd. It's, a, you know, looking at people, you know, pretty much across the board. And there are many people who do not feel welcome in the gallery, who do not feel welcome in the museum. So it's important for me to find different outlets to share the work. And I've been really fortunate where I've been able to share the work, you know, in places like here, this is um, Aperture Foundation in 2017 at the coming out party for Stranger Fruit as part of the summer open. And I've been able to share it with, you know, Smack Melon and Brick and a number of other locations. But I've also been able to share the work in, you know, smaller spaces like this. This is Minka, a holistic healing center here in Brooklyn, not far from where I live. And also, you know, here, this is Hamilton Landmark Galleries in Harlem, which is basically a um, brownstone where the first floor is converted as a gallery space. Again, where the community is invited to come in and, you know, share with the work and, you know, engage with it at a different level. Again, completely different from going to Chelsea, going to the Upper East Side or wherever to these, you know, galleries where people like this typically aren't seen walking around so it's important and i'm you know really glad that i've been fortunate enough to be able to share the work in such a myriad of ways and such different um venues um again like this this is brick uh, you know amazing you know center here in you know downtown brooklyn which has you know a number of amazing community events um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to share the work with an organization called Art and Ad Places, where we were able to display the work in phone booths in and around the Fulton Street Mall. And, you know, this was also something that I was, I've really been interested in, is sharing the work um, locally and publicly. And it's, you know, different, obviously, being able to have the work at a local level, you know, there's something where you can walk up to and, you know, see and, you know, how does this change the, their, the viewers, you know, reaction to the work? Does it give you pause? What does it mean to have, to see these type of images, but on a bus stop or in a billboard?
and you know, last year I had the opportunity through an organization called 14 by 48. I had the opportunity to share the work as a billboard um, here in New York near Times Square and this, you know, incredibly busy intersection. And again, this was really amazing, you know, just being able to have the work up um, for all to see and, you know, there be no context for the work. It was just the image and, you know, the people would, you know, were just invited just like, you know, it's just something different. It's something that you would never, you know, see on a regular basis. Like, think about it right now. How many times have you seen an image like that? Forget an image like that. How many times have you just seen the images of the black body in a public space and it's not selling something? It's not a movie. It's not advertising. It's not, you know, whatever. But, you know, we're just using this for art. And, you know, of course, I'm thinking of, you know, Felix Gonzalez Torres and his billboard series was, you know, a huge influencer and, you know, wanting to have this, you know, very like private moment on such a huge public display. And now I have this billboard somewhere in the hallway. It was sitting on my mom's um, balcony for like the last year. All right, we're almost there. Um, so I have to talk about um, my homeboy, Eli Kintz. This is one of his works. Um, he wrote a book called I Remember Daddy a number of years ago. And basically it's a story, a long form poem talking about the black male from Africa all through the Atlantic slave trade up until now. And it was really beautiful. And I, you know, first um, encountered the work, I believe with the New York Historical Society. And they had this audio display, um, this audio, audio component where it was someone was reading the poem. And these figures were on the screen, zooming in and out, mostly, well, zooming, they were really tight and then zooming out. And as you look at them, you look and you think that they're like, tears or water drops and then as it zooms all the way out you see that it is um, someone who's been lynched and you know that kind of leads to where I you know got the idea for the name Stranger Fruit um, of course is the you know Billie Holiday song Strange Fruit but I was always you know drawn to the Nina Simone version of the song is that just like again repeats in my head over and over again and you know, in that song, she's talking about um, southern trees bearing strange fruit, speaking of lynched bodies hanging from trees in the antebellum south. Um, and a part of the reason why I titled the project Stranger Fruit is because these are modern day lynchings. The bodies are no longer being hung, but they're literally being picked off the streets. So, you know, playing with that idea and that, that's really how it all came to be for, um, for the title and for this work. Um, and this is it, this is the last slide. Um, number 60, we made it, you made it, we made it together. Um, before I, you know, hand it over to Brother Jaime and, you know, we get to your questions, um, I have questions for you and I do not need an answer. You don't need to email me. I mean, you can, if you want to, it doesn't matter to me, but you don't have to, e you don't have to answer it now. You don't have to answer it tomorrow, but um, the questions are this, you see what's going on right now in America and across the globe. What will you do? What is, what are the next steps? We can only do so much talking about the African-American community. What are you prepared to do? Will you hold your, you know, family members who are, you know, have these, whatever, racist tendencies, are you gonna hold them to task? What about, you know, in the workplace? Are you gonna get uncomfortable? Yeah, sure, I love having a paycheck too, but are you gonna hold people to task? Because you see what's at stake. Lives are being lost. And, you know, for as much love as the project is getting, uh, right now, which is, you know, incredibly humbling and incredibly, it's, it's amazing. And it's really overwhelming. And truly everyone who's reached out 
and followed in the last week. Like it's, it's really been incredible. And, you know, I truly love you all, but you know, why does it take a, why does it take this? Why does it take these, you know, tragedies to happen for people to wake up? This is 2020. The work began 2014. The work started to explode in 2017. Sean Bell was 2006. We're still having these conversations. What are you prepared to do? I don't have all the answers. As a country, we need to figure this out. And I guess that's the, miss, the mission statement for the work is like acknowledgement. Can we at least acknowledge that, you know, these men, these women should not have lost their lives? And okay, what's the next step? How can we, you know, acknowledge that this is an issue and now work towards solving it? It's like, it's like fucking ridiculous. What was it last? Was it this a couple of days ago? The NFL talking about they made a mistake with Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, no kidding. We know. Everybody knew at that time that you were making a mistake and that you had ample opportunities to speak to it. But no, everything was no. This is an issue. Go away. Put it. Sweep it under the rug. When are we going to address this? You know, I know you've seen. You know, James Baldwin. And, you know, the clip from um, I Am Not Your Negro, like how much time do you want for progress? Because, you know, when the footage of, you know, George Floyd, you know, came out and, you know, obviously I was already, you know, depressed that week, you know, from the, you know, even before, like, it's crazy, like before this had even happened, you know, and, bef and, and before these, um, um, pretty much before the Bre Breonna Taylor and uh, before, um, uh, Tony McDade had been murdered, you know, just a few weeks ago. There was footage here in just New York City of, you know, cops just beating the shit out of uh, black people in, you know, East New York and in, you know, these black neighborhoods. Why? For masks. And, and you know, and, and you see like the disparity and you're just like, this is 2020 in a pandemic and we still have to deal with this. We still have to go through this. So, I mean, that's my, that's my, um, that's my spiel. And these are my um, questions and this is the project. I hope I've answered some questions. And if you have more questions, you can always email me. And um, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to brother Jaime who um, may have more questions that we can answer together. John, um, I know that uh, we're all uh, profoundly grateful to you for um, you know, sharing your work here tonight, as I said during the intro, it's one of the most powerful bodies of work in contemporary photography, in my opinion. Um, it's certainly t terribly urgent uh, to be seen and shared and, and discussed and contemplated on at this particular uh, historical juncture. Um, I also really deeply appreciate your activism, and your call to action. Um, I mean, I've been in the United States uh, since the mid 90s, um, a little bit earlier than that, actually, uh, almost coincidentally with Rodney King um, being beaten by a, a bunch of thuggish cops in LA. And I remember thinking back then, how, how barbaric, how horrific, how can this be? I mean, coming to the United States, that's the last thing I expected to see um, at impunity to that and then you know really that's that's the measure of what we're living through and have been living through for decades um, there are so many comments and so many expressions of gratitude in the chat i'm gonna do my best to just um get to some of the questions um so um we have a, a question from lindsey carroll uh, she says, what is the significance of the film Edge? And I know you answered that. Do you draw inspiration from non-visual sources, poetry, fiction, music, etc.? cetera? Yeah, um, music, of course. Um, uh, you know, the work of Nia Simone is like always glued on my mind. Um, it's funny, you know, thinking of, you know, obviously I love Nina Simone and <laughs> I, I think if there was an alternate title for the work, um, it would be America Goddamn, um, you know, playing off of uh, Mississippi Goddamn. 
Um, but yeah, um, pr primarily it's visual um, because I'm thinking of visuals um, and just that's kind of my upbringing. Um, again, looking at painting, sculpture, um, those, you know, countless hours, you know, hanging out in the Met and doing research. But um, I know I'm trying to get, trying to get better on poetry and reading. Um, but we're, 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 get, we're getting there. But I draw, draw inspiration from, you know, damn near anything that I got my hands on. Um, here's one from Andy. She says, uh, um, I mean, I'm sorry. Andy says, I'm not sure, uh, the gender uh, sometimes. Um, uh, I know you clarified in the beginning, but considering the inclusivity of the range of black people affected by police do you think in the future you'll ever incorporate black, queer, non-binary women within your work? Would you ever substitute a father instead of a mother? Also, I love the fact that you use four by five. Um, yeah, I get, the, I get that question a lot. Um, the only reason why I don't is because I wanted to, in my mind, to keep it as strong and as consistent as possible. I wanted to keep it mother son and speak to that relationship. Um, again, the, yes, you're absolutely right. All those relationships are very important and the father as well. Um, but I really wanted to hone in on the mother and son component of that relationship, just as a way to keep the viewer looking at this and this over and over and over again from city to city, state to state. Um, thinking of it not as like in terms of distraction, but just in ways of keeping the, um, keeping the viewer grounded to, you know, think about this consistently. Um, so that's really the um, only reason for that. But yeah, it's, it's obvious, it's something that I've always been thinking of while making the work. Um, but this is kind of the reason why it's always been along the same line. Mm -hmm. but hope that uh, here's an, an extension to that question. Perhaps you already fully answered it, but let me just um, uh, share it with you as well. Have you thought about photographing white mothers who have black sons or non-black mothers with black sons? Um, I've thought about it. Um, I have, I think, one image of it, but again, it stands out so much that I think it takes away from the, the whole um, so that's why I had to keep it, you know, I, I felt that it would be most effective black mother or black son to again, drive that point home. Um, again, I, again, yeah, I've thought of all the variables of, you know, different ways to construct the images. And, you know, especially when I was thinking of, you know, in the early years, thinking of representations and how to, you know, you know, construct the bodies and pose the bodies and everything like that, that was something that came up as well. But no, I, I figured for it to be as strong as possible and as consistent as possible that I wanted it to, you know, just showcase black mothers and black sons. Mm -hmm. And um, here's a great question from Alexandria Alkire. Um, and I know you discussed um, the idea of choosing destinations, choosing cities that you go to, but she asks, um, how do you choose a family to photograph? Okay. Um, yeah, geez, I get that. Always asked. Um, so it's a mix. A lot of it is from friends of friends recommending, you know, families or recommending people in, you know, certain neighborhood. Um, basically, I'm like, listen, I want to go to here to photograph or I want to go there or wherever. And, you know, a friend of a friend will, you know, recommend someone. Some families reach out independently via social media, or, you know, Facebook or Instagram. Um, but the majority of it is just this, you know, network of friends across the country who have, you know, been obviously you are not forgotten, you know, and much love to all of you who have helped because, you know, this, again, this project would not, uh, not happen if, you know, because it, it's obviously it's tough. I mean, the only time where I did not have referrals, you know, people referring someone to me, was last year when I was in Los Angeles for the month of May, um, because I just didn't have anyone on the ground. So that year I was out there with my notebook, which I don't know where the hell it is. And basically it was just a little, you know, 
<laughs> notebook from Blick that just had, you know, images that I had cut out in four by six. And I just, you know, walked up to people on the street and asked them, you know, about their family and I, people who I thought, you know, mothers who I thought would have sons or sons, you know, who I thought lived in the neighborhood and just asked them, you know, if I could photograph them for this project. And, you know, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was, you know, difficult as hell, but it was incredible being out there, you know, just for, for that month solely working on the project and just the responses um, that we were getting was, was everything. But that's, that's basically how um, I'm ca connected with all the families. Mm -hmm. um, I, that leads uh, straight into the next question and, and perhaps just an opportunity for you to amplify what you just said with some examples. Um, can you share, this is from Sarma Ozols. Can you share some of your conversations that you had with them while taking these photos? And I would add to that question also, just my own curiosity for knowing, um, mm -hmm. do the, you know, the, the families who participate sometimes have um, visual ideas that they contribute to this process. They say, I would like to maybe be photographed this way. Does that ever happen? Um, not so much. And again, this is credit to um, the, the families for having, you know, so much faith in me to let me, you know, just, they, they trust my vision to, you know, make this happen. Um, yeah, so what I do is before we meet, um, again, because we're on, you know, we're on borrow time, I may not have a lot of time with them. Sometimes when we meet, we'll have time to like, you know, talk at length about the project before we make the image. Again, a lot of times I don't have that luxury because, you know, they're, again, I'm, a lot of people are working families, so I'm catching them at work or between, you know, X, Y, and Z. So um, I send them a rundown with pretty much everything they need to know for the project. And I send them images as well. So like these are like previous images from, and this is the you know, the like the original Michelangelo. Like this is what I'm pulling from, and this is why I'm doing it. This is who I am. This is where I'm from, and this is why this is so important to me. And it also lists you know like this is exactly what you can expect. You know it'll be you know between like thirty minutes minimum to like an hour and a half, two hours max. And we just like go from there. The images are environmental. It is, you know, pretty much where you're living or wherever you feel comfortable, wherever it is, like you let me know, I will go there. I'll meet you there. Um, no worries about it. Um, and then it's just, you know, yeah, it really, it, it varies from, you know, case to case because a lot of time, you know, I mentioned problem solving earlier a lot of it is problem solving like in the heat of the moment because the wild the vast majority of families like i have no idea how big the son is how big the mom is scale or sometimes i don't even know how many sons a mother has so sometimes i'll get there like there was one family in um in los angeles beautiful family i met them at this um was it some the renaming of Obama Boulevard in um, Los Angeles and we met up and I'd only met her one son and then I got to the house and she has three boys and I was like okay um give me a minute let me see if I can how I can you know construct this image with everyone and um you know thankfully it all you know worked out but yeah it's it's just this it's usually me trying to figure it all out how to position the bodies is she sitting? Is she standing? Is she holding the body physically, holding it up? Are multiple people holding it? If there's a second son, um, two is typically harder than one or three. So it's like, okay, well, what is the second son doing? Is he in that position as well? Is, you know, is he in a role of support? So it's just, you know, it's, it's like just working like a madman trying to, you know, problem solve and think of all these different scenarios and how I can um, make the images work like once I'm out there, if that answers the question. Possibly. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
Wow, I, I'm a little bit overwhelmed just by the outpouring of love and respect and admiration in the chat. I mean, every time I look down, there's another 40 new messages. I, we won't you know, possibly be able to get to everybody's feedback, um, but it is just, um, it's deeply felt, it's deeply felt. And I, I'll, I'm trying to just get to a couple more questions before we run out of time. Um, this is um, a question about symbolism from Bessie Petrutsas. Again, if I mispronounce anybody's name, please forgive me. Um, Bessie is asking, is there symbolism behind the side that the mothers are holding their sons on? I noticed they were on the same side and opposite side of La Pieta. Um, yeah, just um, one for consistency and two, I just wanted to make just a shift and it was just a creative decision when I first started the work. Um, that first image I shot in, um, in the church and that's the only image that I use studio lighting for. Everything else is available light, it's just ambient or daylight. And so basically I had the light set up on that side and when I was making that first image, that's what looked the best with the body going um, left to right or in the image, you know, on the right hand side and the, from the head going on the right hand side and then flowing to the left. And I just liked it from, you know, that the way that first looked. And again, thinking of just consistency and, you know, that repetition, that just made the most sense for me. Because if I started going back and forth, I know that like down the road, I would have gotten pissed off with myself. I'd have been like, you know, make up your mind, Jonathan, what are you, what are you doing? Um, so, so that was it. It was really just consistency of um, having the bodies all in one, um, in one fashion. Yes, uh, consistency and discipline um, are so important to, to visual art. And, um, and it's, it's very, it focuses our attention so clearly. Um, and it's, I think that's a measure of the work's success is that, that you can translate that visually so powerfully um, and it brings me back as well to the beginning of the lecture when you said back in uh, I don't know if it was 2012 or 2000 uh, or even previous to that you said I didn't have the visual language to express um, what I needed to express and you uh, clearly showed us the great benefits of research and how you've combined so many different insights into uh, major and, and minor work sometimes in the artistic canon and come up with a very fertile ground um, to start your own aesthetic exploration. Um, yeah, to it, this it was, idea of... Mm -hmm. Sorry, it, yeah, it, it, was, it was six years between, you know, 2008, the verdict and like really saying like, yeah, I want to speak to this and 2014, the first image being made. And then, yeah, piggybacking off of that, after that first image was made, I didn't make another image for like five months because I was just thinking like, you know, what is this? So I, you know, I had the image, I printed it out, I put it up in my, in my room and I would literally just walk into the room, look at the print, walk out the room, come back in, look at it leave again and just think of like you know what it made me feel and you know and that's really again where like all the the research really came into play and how that was so um so important and so vital to you know pretty much every um everything that I do pretty much every visual you know work that I create there's some mm -hmm. relation to painting even in the athletes work that I you know do um so yeah, I always like having that as a foundation to start off of and then working my way around. Um, here's a, a, a question from MVP Picks uh, that also relates to process. Um, you use the word performance. Your work is both documentary and portrait while conceptual and staged. You're both image taker and image maker. Could you say a little about where your work lies within contemporary photography and then just compliment you have created something truly powerful and inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, great, great, gracious, gracious. I mean, um, always thank you for everybody who's um, stopped by and made comments. Um, yeah, the outstrowing of love has been 
overwhelming. Um, where do I lie in contemporary photography? Um, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I've been, you know, making this work again since 2014 and, um, obviously I'm, I pay attention to, uh, contemporary photographers because, you know, their work is, you know, important. Like I'm not just, when I'm doing research, I'm not just looking at, you know, classical artists. I'm looking at who's working right now. Um, Jeez, as far as like where I would consider the work where it falls right now. And I have no idea because it's something that I, you know, never really considered. I always considered myself just doing the work and the work is the work and the story has always come first for me. So it's never, maybe it has been a consideration, but it was just like somewhere in my subconscious, but really I've just, and you know, anybody who's been around me, you know, I've, all I've been doing is just thinking about the work and just making the work. It's always the, you know, at the forefront of my mind. So, you know, from 2014, 15, 16, you know, I'm just thinking of like, okay, traveling, where are we going next? Where, I, how can I set up these, you know, how can I, you know, set it up so that I can make these, um, uh, these images. I mean, just for this, this talk, we were, you know, am I allowed to say we we're supposed to do it like in October? But I was, or I was asked in October, but I had to like say I couldn't, you know, promise it because I thought I was going to be in Texas making images. I ended up being in Texas in January of this year. And thank God I got there before this COVID-19 business um, shut everything down. Um, but yeah, I, I just focus on, you know, trying to get these images in, trying to get, you know, the work done. And... I mean, I, and in, where it falls in contemporary photography, I man, I have no idea. I just let it, I let the chips fall, you know, where they do. And I'm not really the judge of all of that. Someone else will say, you know, oh, this is where it, it lands. And, 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 you know, all, all, of, all of you who have, you know, reached out and said how important you've, you know, felt the work is and, you know, how you feel it's, you know, holds up in this time with contemporary photography. I mean, it, it means a lot, but um, yeah, I'm just out here doing the work and trying to make it all, all happen and then you know, eventually make this book. Um, do you have a publisher for the book at this point or is that down the road? That's down the road. I'm, st I'm still trying to, you know, get the images finished before I really have those conversations. Um, people have been asking and I have a little list and I might be checking it twice but I ain't saying nothing. So. <laughs> <laughs> wise, wise. Um, certain things uh, need to be spoken about when they're happening. So, um, you know, we, we're pretty much out of time. So I'm going to be selfish and I'm just going to ask you, um, you've been very clear about talking uh, on, on the subject of the genesis of the work, how, you know, it all got started and, and what your road has been like. Uh, can you talk about the end point of the journey? When do you consider this project done? Yeah, the, um, you know, so I showed on the map, um, just like the last few locations that I want to go to. Um, because, yeah, the project will come to an end. Yes, I could do this for the rest of my life, but I sure as hell do not want to. Um, there are other issues and other um, problems that I want to tackle visually. And I've already begun laying the groundwork for that, um, for the next steps, for what is the branch off of Stranger Fruit? What are the next, you know, modes of work and next questions that I want to answer? Um, so I'm very interested in getting to work on that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to shoot this forever because it's, it's, it's heavy. It's, you know, obviously it's heavy for, you know, the mothers and the project, you know, just for having to do this, but it's also heavy um, on my end because it's, you know, reliving that trauma of, um, of you know, the Sean Bell trial and, you know, thinking of um, Rodney King, you know, I, I was really too young to understand what was going on, but I was old enough for, you know, Amadou Diallo really started paying attention at 
Sean Bell, and the names just continue, continue, continue. So, and again, it's just like this, again, it's the community reliving these traumas. It's, it's heavy. It's, it's really intense. And, um, you know, the next time you see one of your black friends, give them a hug. Cause, um, it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of weight right now. And, um, yeah, so yeah, the pro the project will end and, um, you know, but I'm, but I'm not, I'm also not in a rush. Like, I mean, I want the project to end in its time, but I'm not like, okay, it's got to end here. It will, you know, the process is part of, you know, letting the work dictate and just being diligent about making the work and, you know, not, you know, sitting on my heels, waiting for things to happen. I go out and make them happen. Um, again, for instance, you know, this January, this past January, I was in, um, madness. Um, shout out to Natalia who helped uh, assist. We were in New Orleans, Little Rock and Houston, three, four families in three cities in three days making images. And thank goodness we were able to do it then because I have no idea when I'd be able to get back on the road to do it now. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the project takes time and it'll be finished in its own time and we'll get there when we get there. Um, but yeah, it, it will come to an end and I'll, I'll, I'll know. I have a, I have a good sense of knowing when, um, you know, I just go off the instincts and I, I, I get there and I just, you know, make the images and I figure it all out and it kind of all works somehow. Mm -hmm. It's magic. Yeah. It's magic. Each, each image has its own story and it's kind of magical in a really weird sense, but it's really beautiful. Um, if I could say it real quick. Um, okay. So this image, it's still up in, um, I'll tell you one story. This image in North Minneapolis um, shot 2019 in January. If you've been to Minnesota, it is cold. It is really cold. I've been trying to go to Minnesota for like three years because I had, again, talking about the images burned in my damn head. I've like ugh, black bodies, snow. It has to happen. What a closer, what an image it could be. So I was like, okay, I have to, I have to make this happen. I, go out there and you know i'm from new york i'm an idiot i don't remember i'm like oh yeah winter in minnesota is like negative 10. that could be really dangerous to be outside in but magically i get there and i land and it's unseasonably warm it's like 47 degrees record high and the lift driver is telling me that the snow is melted pretty much all over the city so while i'm in the car you know cursing mother nature um, we get up to the suburbs where I was staying and, you know, there's still a little bit of snow and I get to this amazing family's place. And, you know, this is a couple blocks from where they live. And, you know, thankfully there's snow and shout out to my boy who's in the image and his name couldn't be more perfect. Um, mom's name is Jewel and the son, her son, Justice. A man, mm. Justice doesn't take his shirt off for nothing. He gets in the pool and then he takes the shirt off, as mom said. I'm sorry if I'm blowing up your spot. I'm sorry. I got you. But my man did it for me. He did it for the shoot. He took his shirt off. Mama got up there and was strong and held him. And she was like, damn, what you've been eating? And we made the image and, you know, it all somehow magically happened. Um, but, yeah, that's the... That's the project, and it's, I don't know. I don't know how it happens. Maybe it's someone from above watching. Who knows? All I know is, you know, this is the work, and um, we make it happen. That's how I get down. Um, it's been an amazing evening um, of inspiration, and uh, I I will be thinking about your words for a long time, and I'm sure I'm not the only person in the audience who feels that way. Um, lest we forget, although we have mentioned it, uh, you know during the, the course of the talk, the course of the conversation, um, the reach of these images is by no means limited to the United States. It's inspired by what, by what happens in the United States. It's shaped by what happens in the United States, but it reaches far beyond. And here's a little message of thank you from Australia. And I just wanna share that so that you know um, that this is inspiring, um, people who live in, in systems of oppression worldwide. 
and who lose uh, people near and dear to them worldwide. Um, so here's this message from Australia and we'll end on that note. And I just wanna thank everybody uh, who joined us tonight. Um, every time I look down at that chat, okay, right now 90 new messages, there's no way. Um, but you know, we feel the love in the room. I'm sure John feels the encouragement. It's a lonely road. It's, it's a road that you've been walking on for uh, six years plus um, with very, very, very little um, material help. And, and that's a testament to your uh, vision and your um, sense of mission as well, uh, your artistic dedication. And, and there's so many lessons here tonight. Let me just uh, conclude with these words from Australia, from Talia Smith. She says, thank you for your generosity and time in presenting and sharing today. I am in Australia and we are feeling the waves of violence against First Nations people here. Much love and respect. Thank you again. Thank you, John, for a brilliant, inspiring lecture. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yes, indeed. Peace, peace. Big ups to everybody. Many thanks for showing out. You know, love has been overwhelming. And like I said, you, you are not forgotten. Um, peace and love, strength and honor. And um, if you have any questions, or you know, hit me up. I try to, uh, you know, as, as the homie said, as the homie Paul Mooney said, I am neighborhood, not Hollywood. And reach out, you can always get in touch. Peace and love.